What's going on, everybody? It's Dr. Homebrew. Here we are back again. We're talking about homebrew and uh, talking to home brewers, um, probably about cleaning and sanitizing, which are the two most important things you can do in homebrewing. You can buy the best equipment. You can buy the best ingredients, the freshest ingredients. But if you have mung in your bunghole, you're, you're going to have a bad time. So don't do it. And uh, stick with Five Star Chemicals for cleaning and sanitizing. Go to Five Star Chemicals. If you love to clean com. things, man, this is like the best hobby, right? Yeah. Five Star Chemicals dot com. If you love to clean, if you love, if you to, love to do your dishes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And if you hate doing it, um, Five Star will make it easier because you oh, don't yeah. have to scrub. You let you soak stuff with PBW. You don't have to <clears> scrub <throat> it off. You can hose it off or lightly, you know, whatever. Um. Okay, normally I would say like, ah, oh, this is like bullshit, but I kind of want to get into the beer. We already have John here. John, welcome back, dude. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, what's this beer? It it says any IPA, and I, I don't think, I think you're punking me. I don't really think it is what it <laughs> is, right? No, it is. Your favorite <laughs> beer style, buddy. <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Is this something you've done before, torturing a poor podcast host like myself with uh any ipa or is this brand new for you um i've brewed quite a bit of ipa in the past but this is the first shot with uh some uh some different hops so we'll leave it at that until okay have a chance to is it your it is it your first uh new england style ipa i brewed uh this once before okay all right so. how is it how is it brewing a beer that's intentionally cloudy when you've made a ton of IPAs that aren't, I mean, assuming that there aren't, and it's not like a, like a knock kind of question. I'm, I'm actually really curious how that it's, is mentally for, as a home brewer, making that transition to let's make this like mud. I don't know. It's not mud. It's just no, not I know. And that I was giving you shit. For, <laughs> but, uh, it's just one ingredient that does it. Okay. So it's not that hard. You should try it sometime, JP. No, man, I don't even brew. You know, to be to be honest with you, I can't brew. I have a hard time brewing uh, light colored beers. I don't know what it is. Like my, I, I refuse to fuck with water. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want. I don't want to do water chemistry. I hated chemistry uh, as a kid. I don't want to deal with it. So I'm like, I brewed a couple of pale ales, but they're sort of mealy and blah. Yeah, um, yeah and you know, I, I can do a, a pilsner, okay. Um, but yeah, like my Belgian table beer comes out pretty good ish, but other than that, I, I wouldn't be able to brew an IPA. There's no way, yeah. even if I wanted to, I'd have to How about it. a Belgian dark, strong IPA. Oh, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I just, here we go. That I just, I just, I just made up a new, I, that, I'm, I'm dropping gold here. You guys, this okay. is like a brand new style that is going to take the world by storm in 22. Sure are. Call the leprechaun. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, Char, why don't you go ahead and go first, man? You're, uh, you're, you're rip running ready to go. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in fuego right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep going. So, uh, sure. John, pretty much so you're a Vermonter. So anything you brew is an IPA is going to be a new England IPA kind of by definition, right? So uh, say, sorry, I see you roll your eyes at that dad joke. So I'm, <laughs> that's not even worthy. That's not even worthy of a response. So uh, uh, no, I, I really like this. Uh, this is, oh, and we'll get out of the way. It's a different show. Uh, we talked about in the last show, you are a strong, self-reliant individual who is not in a homebrew club, uh, but you're a, a rugged individualist that can, can make great beer on your own. So cheers. Oh. I assume they have homebrew clubs there, right? I mean, they got to have some. Uh, there is a local club that I, I, I just haven't gotten involved with, but I, I think it's gone through a few iterations and COVID kind of put a stop to everything. So and it's not yeah. a densely populated state to start with, really. So I mean, no, I mean, there's uh, we're, we live in a populated area, but nothing like the, the Bay yeah. Area like where you guys are at. <laughs> yeah, uh, dude. But the, I think the three little kids running around my house probably have a more, uh, <laughs> you know, a bigger deal with uh, not being in a homebrew club. Yeah, so. for 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 sure. Yeah, uh, and I I figure probably Vermont state law requires you to like build a covered bridge with your friends before you can start a homebrew club. Yeah, that's New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, I I sorry. I don't, are bias. you guys like you guys like hate each other? Like it's no, one of those I grew things up in New Hampshire. Where you're, no, we're, we're, we're the twin states. 
Nice. Right. They nice. kiss each other when they see each other. On yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I really enjoyed this beer a lot. Uh, what was interesting was, so I opened this up and it didn't really have, it must have been like a really high fill because I, I admit I was kind of in a hurry to judge these. Okay, not in a hurry, like I did a slapdash job, but it was getting close to the show and I'm like, all right, I've got to judge these beers uh, because that's not going to get done otherwise. Uh, and I didn't look at the bottle and I didn't hear a hiss, but there was still a big head and carbonation. So I assume you just filled it up to the tippy top. Uh, and there just wasn't really that, or for whatever reason, I just didn't get a hiss when I opened it up. Uh, and I noted that it doesn't have anything to do with your score, but it's just a, a thing that I had, had noticed, uh, aroma. I mean, it's very hop forward and quote juicy, uh, as people talk about for any IPA. Uh, and I, I get tropical fruit and also like a little bit of juicy fruit gum type aroma, mm. not in, in that kind of, as it warms up, that goes away, but it's not, not in the sense that sometimes you get that in a Belgian style beer, uh, or a beer that's fermented too warm. You'll get like a fermentation, juicy fruit character, but this seemed to me like a definitely, it was all, it was, it came from the hops. It didn't seem because usually if you get juicy fruit from bad fermentation or from or because you want it and you get it from a yeast strain there are usually other aromas associated with that that kind of clue you into the fact that either it's an off off aroma or it's an improper yeast and I, I didn't get that 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 to me was all from from hop selection uh no malt uh aroma which is okay for an any ipa no alcohol no off aromas it's very clean and inviting. I uh, gave it 10 out of 12. Uh, so I really love that aroma. Uh, appearance, I mean, I've had commercial any IPAs that didn't have an aroma this nice. Uh, but that's, and that's half the point of what you're going for is to focus on the aroma and the flavor of the hops uh, as much as, if not more than, the bitterness. Uh, appearance, three out of three. Uh, it's straw colored. It's uh, hold it up to the camera. It's, it's hazy, but it's not, it's not gunky, hazy. Uh, I, I think we've all kind of, hopefully everyone's gotten beyond that, you know, when everyone know. got into the NEIPA years ago, where they were trying all kinds of weird stuff to try to get that, that haze that was just nonsense and just bad looking. Uh, the head is large and persistent. Again, three out of three. Uh, initially, the flavor is uh, a tropical fruit with malt low and in the background. And the malt is low and stays in the background throughout. Uh, but again, that's the point of the style. This is a hop forward style. Uh, certainly it needs to have some malt character and some body, but this is not a beer that you're going to, to pick apart the complexity of the, the, mar the malt bill. <laughs> this, this is a, a background to showcase, showcase hops. Uh, bitterness is medium high, uh, which I really like because I, I think that when these hazy beers are so focused on flavor and aroma that they neglect bitterness, they can become kind of insipid. And I think the best examples of New England slash hazy IPA have a firm bitterness as well as hop flavor and hop aroma. I mean, it doesn't have to be West Coast IPA, double IPA levels of bitterness. It doesn't have to be, you know, shooting for a hundred IBUs, but I think you need a firm bitterness in this style to keep you know, to give it some structure and keep it just from being, you know, insipid and just not, not pleasant to drink. So that was the bitterness to me was, was really fantastic. Uh, the finish is long and balanced toward hop flavor and bitterness. It's well attenuated, no off flavors. Uh, I gave it 16 out of 20, uh, mouthfeel five out of five, uh, medium carbonation, that's why I was guessing you just filled the bottle up way high because if there was no hiss and a big airspace, uh, that would sort of indicate there wouldn't be any carbonation and it just wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have the medium carbonation this beer has. Uh, medium high body. Uh, I'm going to guess you use oats. Don't tell us. Uh, but that's kind of the modern way of getting that, that haze. And the oats also give you that more creamy uh, mouthfeel. I did note that it's not creamy, but it's on the creamy side compared to astringency. And that's partly what that 
like the oats and other adjuncts that give you the haze will, will give you that you know, higher body and more creamy mouthfeel. Uh, no warming, no astringency. Again, five out of five. Overall impression, I gave it a nine for a total of 43. I, I really like this beer a lot. Uh, this is very well made. It's extremely clean. Uh, it has a lot of hop flavor, a lot of hop aroma, and it you know, backs it up with that medium high uh, bitterness. Uh, it's kind of getting in the territory that I'm not sure exactly what I might do to improve this uh, because it's already up to, uh, to excellent. And I, you know, I'll, I'll be curious what uh, Cooper has to say. We talked about all the beers before the show, except for this one. Uh, so I will be uh, definitely curious about his opinion. Uh, and if I scored it like 20 points higher than him, or if he went up to like the whole 50 uh, on this one uh, himself. So, <laughs> oh, Brian? Well, uh, get him, Brian. I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll tell you what's wrong here. No. Uh, I, it's I, a 13. I, actually, <laughs> I, I got an, I listened for the hiss and I actually got a nice little hiss when I opened it up. Uh, you might you might have been hurrying a little too much because it it was um, a little hiss and I I think I I tried to the label was again right on the top on that and I peeled it back and it looked like a decent fill level so uh, yeah it's fine um, yeah again we've got a lot of these little uh, hair ties around now so that's good <laughs> yep uh, yeah really pleasant nose nice hops right up front um, I get a lot of passion fruit. Uh, big tropical notes dominating um it's quite fruity there's some stone fruit as well uh it's very you know fruity estuary okay the style uh backgroundy kind of basic u.s style base malt uh below that nothing nothing earth shattering and it shouldn't be super noticeable but it's clean and and um, the beer overall is bright uh there's no diacetyl acetaldehyde um not a lot of you know sulfur or anything like that. Um, Appearance-wise, it's quite hazy. Uh, you can you can see you know it's not like a the milkshake quality haze. It's it, it's you can see through it to you know to kind of shadowy uh, shapes of things behind it. You can't really see through it, but it's not so opaque that it looks white or you know uh, like paper lining the glass. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's um the head was uh you know fairly persistent uh mostly fine bubbles a whitish head um you know yeah appearance wise it's it's what you want for a, a new england ipa flavor wise it's it's fairly hoppy quite uh fruity big surprise there right um and has a good amount of uh the tropical hop characters that i was getting in the nose there um and again some stone fruit and a bit of citrus here coming out of the flavor um the bitterness is to me i i would disagree with brian i don't know if, if something else is being perceived as bitterness to to him but i'm not getting a ton of bitterness in spear it, i would say it's kind of medium low fairly inobtrusive and out of the way of the you know everything else that's there um, but it's, it's, again, it's not boring or insipid. It's, it's got enough, you know, to balance it. Um, and I think a lot of the, at the impression of like, a you know, a bitter, like long boiled, uh, high alpha hop early in the, in the boil is not here. It's not that, you know, hundred IBU beer, anything like that, or even close to it. It's just, um, just enough to balance. And it, a lot of it is the, you know, sometimes you can get, you can get some bitterness from, whirlpool hops and i don't know i mean if it's just how it's measured and in, in uh you know ibus it, you can get scientific on it and try to figure out what exactly all that is but it's i think it expresses it, itself differently when you use a big whirlpool hop and you get your bitterness just mainly from that as it does when you do just a boil hop and, and boil it for a long time it definitely comes across differently but you do get some bitterness from that it's just softer and i think Part of that too is going to be the body of the beer too. So I don't know, but it just, it, it fits in there with everything else that's there. It doesn't really poke out too, too strongly to me. Um, ferment is nice and clean. Uh, I felt the beer was fairly dry, but not overly so. Uh, it's not, you don't want it to be sweet or really 
uh, you know, playing off the fruit with a big sweetness there, getting crazy. Uh, so yeah, it just has a nice good balance, uh, uh, balance to the hop, that tropical passion fruit lingers in the aftertaste with a little bit of malt, you know, it's not, there, there's some malt here. It's a beer. <laughs> it's not lemonade. Um, mouthfeel wise, it's smooth and soft overall. Uh, the body uh, has a medium full impression. Uh, no obvious warmth, somewhat creamy, not annoyingly so. Uh, not milk shakingly so. Medium carbonation, you know, kind of hitting most of the points there for what you need. Um, yeah, overall, uh, it's a nice drinking beer. It's a really good version of a uh, New England IPA. I, I would like even more hops. I would like it. I would like just uh, even more, a little hot brightness, just shining through, like maybe, you know, some more, um, you know, additional kind of tropical notes in there that you could get. I know it takes a lot of hops to get to even to this point, <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. just really uh, blow people away. I mean, that's the point of the beer. Some of them are just like, how did they get that much hop in there? And others, it's like, you get a, a mediocre New England IPA and it's like, yeah, it's just not there. But <laughs> you know, this one is there. It's it's to the, you know, that kind of like four pounds per barrel, five pounds per barrel kind of like cr it's got enough hops in it to it, like to make it go, hey, this is what we got going on here. This is a one trick. No, it's not a one trick pony, I shouldn't say. It's it's got the 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 softness and the body, um, along with that that big hop impression and just like you know, the haze. Uh it just, you know, sometimes you pour a, 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 you get a hazy IPA at a, at some of these West Coast breweries and it's at the, well, it's settled out of the keg. It's not, it's not hazy. So sorry. <laughs> I was like, well, that's our hazy though. So drink it and it's good. You know, it's like, and then you go to the East Coast and you, you know, went uh, to the, the homebrewers conference there at, in Rhode Island. And, and half the time you're just like, oh, okay, hazy, hazy, hazy. Oh, there's an IPA. So you order the IPA and <laughs> it's hazy too. <laughs> so, yeah, so usually moderately hazy but they still call it a just I, that's the ipa it's it's a little hazy so i it's fun though i i really had a good time going out there uh, and tasting beers at, at the pubs around providence and tasting some of the home brews that some of the locals did there and and really getting to experience that i don't hate hazy ipas like 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 jp does and some of these other guys i i don't order them often it's more of my wife's go-to but I'll always taste it. And it's like, oh, that's a good hazy. That's really nice. I could drink a pint of that, but give me my West Coast or what, you know, <laughs> whatever. But I just think a little more hops would, would make it improve. Um, body wise, it's there. Strength wise, it's nice. You could probably even get away with a little more alcohol. It's not really poking out that way, but you don't want it to be an alcohol bomb either. Or go to double double IPA territory. It's kind of nice where it is. I gave it a forty. We're three points off, Brian. We're fine. <laughs> All right, good. See, that just goes to show with the, the quality uh, homebrew judging and homebrew uh, medical care that Dr. Homebrews are, Dr.'s homebrew are giving you, that we can still come up with no mutual consultation with about the same score. I will say, because <clears throat> I do have thoughts about this beer, um, because I probably, I would imagine out of the three of us, I probably have had more hazy IPAs than you guys. I'm going to bet. You Probably have just because <laughs> of doing the session solely yeah, from prob that probably reason. you're right. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very good example of the style. I think it might be a touch too bitter comparatively to the other beers that I've had the other beers. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get that really soft pillowy roundness and make it smooth all the way through, it's not there. I prefer this to that stuff. I prefer what you're making because the one of the main, you know, problems that I have with hazy IPAs is that they're not IPAs. They're not bitter. There's no bitterness to them. It's just soft. It's like a pale ale that is in a pillowcase. It's just I don't know I don't know what it is. <laughs> it, it's not it's not an IPA, but yours actually tastes like an IPA. There's bitterness to it. There's hop obviously there's hop mm -hmm. flavor, but it's it's the the bitterness that applies it's not as soft and pillowy and i appreciate that out of it but it it is it's not as aggressive as like a normal ipa 
if that makes any sense. Yeah. So you're like you're riding that line. You you found that beer to be like in between those two styles, in my opinion, which is uh, uh very biased. Um, but I think it's I think it's a very good example. Yeah, I would have given it a forty also. And it is there well, is bitterness to it. Yeah. it. It's it's so one thing I wanted to say too is there's almost no hop bite to it. Like you just get some of these beers that they throw so much hops in the late end and and the the whirlpool and the dry hop and it just you drink it and it just like coats your tongue and just like like singes you and you're just like oh like that's burn ow yeah it's it's actually like a sensation of pain and just like turns you off this does not have any of that really so you you know you got to tread a line if you push the hops up too much like i said oh, more hops you know have fun with it mm. but you, you you could go into dangerous territory there so this is a nice it strikes a nice balance between having just enough hop and keeping it soft at the same time and not not biting Agreed. You know, you know what it reminds me of a little bit is uh, a treehouse hazy IPA. Because uh, I, my old job, I had a friend that was a, a coworker, and he was from uh, Connecticut, and he would go back there pretty regularly for family stuff. And when he came back, he'd always bring like a whole bunch of Connecticut beer and like share it with everybody, which is really nice of him. Uh, and that's like one of the first hazy beers I ever had was a treehouse. And it was hazy, and it had the body, and it had the aroma, and it had the flavor. Uh, and it was kind of before you know any IPA was a thing, right? It was still kind of a relatively local. This is probably six or seven years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember liking it because it still had that that bitterness, just like you were saying, JP. Uh, it's yeah. it's got that bitterness and that structure. Yeah, agreed. I like it. I don't know. Um, we, yeah, what was the, did we get to what the hop was yet? No. We, we need to let him talk about his beer. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So, um, let's see here. The, uh, so, I actually had a hard time. I've got a three vessel um, Herm system, and I undershot the mash temp. I ended up doughing in at like 140, and my pump broke. So, I couldn't actually. Oh, no. I it's okay. I fixed it, but I couldn't actually <laughs> oh, God. Temp up for about a half an hour. And so I was just like, oh. all right, I've been at 140 for 30 minutes, let's just ramp it up. And, um, so I, I just ramped it up to 158 by that point. And, um, I was like, right, you know, it's probably good. We got through all the ranges and you know, it's all, everything's probably converted. Um, so that probably lent to like a slightly drier, less body, um, beer i would think which i'm with jp i like that and uh, a little more bitterness too yeah so um anyway here we go we got it's a 10 gallon batch um it's 41 percent pale malt uh 41 percent uh, so maris 41 percent maris otter 41 percent um wireman pills and then uh 18 percent quaker oats from the grocery store <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. I boiled. I had one uh, bittering addition at 60 minutes of mosaic, um, and then that was calculated at 15.2 IBUs. And then I did kind of a double whirlpool, where I chilled down to 195 ish, and then did one ounce of um, Citra Eldorado mosaic and Idaho Seven. And I believe the Citra and Eldorado were the Lupo Max, um, you know, kind of a, a hot pellet where they take all the vegetative or some of the vegetative matter out. So you get more of the lupulin gland. And then um, I did the same mixture. I chilled it down again to 180 and did uh, Citra, Eldorado, Idaho 7 mosaic, but two ounces of each. Wow. I, I love Idaho seven and that's maybe why I love this beer so much. That's just such an amazing <laughs> hop and it's got such great flavor and aroma. Uh, it just really, and it plays well with other hops too, as you, you, yeah. your beer shows. I like, yeah, I like the mosaic and Citra also the Idaho seven. That's, yeah. those are all good choices. Um, the Eldo. Yeah. Good stuff. I was going to say too, like with the dryness and a little bit more bitterness, it is almost like one could argue the, west coast version of a new england ipa perhaps <laughs> maybe i'll make it um i mean that's why we like it i don't know right so on the dry hop i did um 
I, I didn't put it in my notes, but probably day two or day three of active fermentation, I know I did four ounces of those four hops again. So a pound of dry hop in 10 gallons plus, you know, whatever those other ounces added up to in the boil. So there was a lot of hops in this. Um, it's you know, literally I, a shit ton. That's how you do it. Was a shit, it was a shit ton of hops and it was a, it was very expensive. <laughs> Um, I pitched, a, I, I did a three rehydrated packs of um, American East Coast ale yeast from Lalamond and a three liter starter. So I got that going, um, oxygenated for uh, uh, one liter a minute for four minutes. And then that thing was, unlike the uh, Pilsner from the last show, that thing was ripping at 12 hours. Wow. Um, and then I ended up kegging it by day nine. So I ramped up the temp, started at 66, got it up to 68 by day four, 70 by day six, and then um, kegged at day nine. Probably uh, a good idea not to wait too long because you want to avoid oxygen in this beer, obviously. So Yeah. And I think one of the things that I've uh, made mistakes in the past is leaving the dry hop on the beer for too long or the beer on the dry hop for too long. And... Um, this thing had some hot burn in the beginning hmm. when it was first kegged. Hmm. Holy moly. It was, <laughs> it was difficult. It probably stuck around until probably a month or so after the brew wow. date. Um, but, you know, it's like, you know, like Brian kind of alluded to it, um, you know, more hops, then you get the hot burn, less, you know, it's like it, this balance of when, when you drink it, you know, yeah. you had the heart, as soon as the hop burn is gone with this beer, it was, it was pretty incredible, but it's actually held up pretty well. Um, and then the water, you know, the water is super important. As you guys know, with these beers, I did um, a shop for uh, uh, sulfates at 114, chlorides at 118. And then because of my, um, my town water, my calcium was at 113. So kind of a one-to-one -one for the sulfates to chloride. And then the calcium was just high because of what I had to start with. It was local water, but adjusted somewhat. Uh, you, you added yep. some, uh, some chlorides to it apparently, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I get rid of the chlorine and the chloramines with uh, potassium and bisulfite. Yeah. What do you think about that, guys? Good stuff? I like the recipe, yeah. You know, I, I always, as far as getting rid of uh, chloramines, I was always super paranoid about that. Uh, so I would do a carbon filter and then use like a half a Camden tablet, quarter of a Camden tablet, something like that, which is the potassium metabisulfite. Mm -hmm. And never really had a problem with uh, uh, any kind of uh, chlorophenol uh, stuff with my beer. You just got to yeah. be careful not to put in like an entire, too much Camden tablet stuff. Because then you can, you know, if, and if you're feeding your beer to people that have sulfite uh, uh, allergies or sensitivity, you have to be a little careful. Like a little bit is fine, but once you get up to like a whole tablet for like a 10 gallon batch or something, that's way too much. <laughs> so I did also add it uh, at kegging because I'd heard that hmm. it, uh, it scrubs oxygen. Hmm. Um, so. I was going to ask if you had any trip, tricks for keeping oxygen. Uh, that's, that's interesting. It's not purple and it's, no. <laughs> two months and it's been kegged and then bottled. <laughs> so, nice. I mean, I, I was pretty anal about the packaging. So you gotta you know, be man. knowing what oxygen can do to these. What do yeah. you feel? Uh, there's, there's no oxidation in this at all that I could tell. There's an yeah. excellent job. Yeah. You, you have a counter pressure of some kind, obviously, or I've got the Blickman beer gun, the beer gun. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, it was interesting in the bottle, there was, you know, you kind of move the bottles around, you know, you go like this and you can see the, uh, you know, like the Pilsner would foam up in the bottle and then obviously go back into it. That hazy IPA, you'd roll it around and it was like water in there. There was no head, no end. And so when you, wow. um, Brian Shar, when you said that you, there was no hiss, I was like, huh, because I, I bottled probably 18 of these and sent you guys the best six today or five that I, that I did. Well, that's um, what we come to expect. Honestly. Well, you know, I, I think that, 
You yeah, just... I think that maybe Cooper is right in that maybe I was just trying to get through these and give them all the attention they deserved. And I probably opened it up and was thinking more about, you know, pouring it and judging it than I was about the actual, because I didn't check the bottle for the, the, the air, like the air in the neck or how high the fill was. Uh, and I think Cooper's right. I probably just somehow was distracted, didn't consider that, and then just assumed I didn't hear it. Uh, but then everything, the carbonation was fine. I just remember looking at the bottle and saying like, oh, it's, it's nice and hazy in there. You can definitely mm. see that through the bottle. <laughs> no problem there. Right. Cool. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but Cooper, what would you do if you wanted to turn this into a, a West Coast? What versus would you do? Oh. With, uh, the East Coast. Because you're like, eh, it's tipping that. Yeah. yeah, so you could make like a juicy IPA out of this. Uh, it's going to, you know, with all those oats in there, you'd have a hell of a time clarifying it if you were going to do it from mm -hmm. this recipe. So I don't know what it's going to do to the beer if you take out the oats, but, you know, I don't know. You don't need to make a West Coast IPA out of it. Just, you know, do your West Coast IPAs, West Coast style, and, yeah. you know, change your water. Uh, don't use the oats and see what it tastes like with the same recipe if you want. I mean, that would be a really interesting side-by-side, -side, same beer, with the yeah. same uh hop regimen i i kind of like the softer you know as as things have aged and we'll see what happens as guidelines are updated but i think that ipas have become less of a, a bitterness war you know battle to get to 100 plus ibus and more of just like hey you can have a nice soft um bitterness along you know reasonable just enough to balance and you don't have to go crazy with it with a lot of late hops and and those are the kind of ips i personally like with a lot of more modern kind of tropical um you know uh even uh, some sometimes the diesel fuel or the you know crazy like you know caddy hops that the 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 marijuana hops and everything in balance you know i, I kind of i tend to like those those tropical hops myself the the citra mosaic and, and some of those other ones just you know nice that I, I, one of the one of the best hazy IPAs I've had was uh, from Cellar Baker in San Francisco. Then they had an all galaxy. Uh, I think it was a double IPA, but I, I don't even remember what it's called. We were going there, went there before a concert. I'd never been there before, but it had some of their beer and it was just like, wow, I got a really good feel for what galaxy was. Cause it was just all galaxy. And there was a <laughs> metric ton of it in the beer. And it was just so soft and, and just bright with that, you know, the, you know, just on the edge of burning, but not, not harsh. It was just right. And I was like, wow, that's amazing how much hop got into that. And that that's galaxy is a fun one to use when it's fresh. I think sometimes you, you know, you got to really be concerned about what hops you're using and, 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 you know, what harvest year they were and how they've been stored and everything to, to make a really good beer like this. And, and again, yeah, your bill for this uh, batch of beer is like, okay, well, are we going to eat this month or yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I spent it all on hops, honey. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> go uh, the food bank. All right. Well, if that's it, John, we'll let you split off, dude. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thanks for sharing. Thank that. you. Yep. All right. We're going to take a fast break, everybody. And we're going to come right back and uh, I don't know, do something else. Cool. So hang tight. It's Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks for hanging on everybody. We are on the phone with Matt. Matt, welcome to the show, dude. Thank you. Hey, you called us long distance, uh, all the way from uh, Michigan. Uh, That's right. This bill is going to be crazy on this Zoom call here. Yeah. Thanks for singing beer. This is a uh, a jalapeno smoked porter. I can yeah, say yeah. I've never had a jalapeno smoked porter before, and I'm excited for it. I like right. smoked beers. Not you know, people always like the people like to shit on a lot of things. I like. One of them is uh, pumpkin beers. I like pumpkin beers. I'm going to say it right now. But the other thing is smoked beers. It's a very niche, you know, uh, crowd base, I guess, for smoked beer. So I'm excited about it. I've had a couple jalapeno beers in my lifetime. Um, some are good and some aren't. Most aren't. Um, but I think a smoked porter with a jalapeno, I'm excited for it. I'm 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 ready for this beer. But uh, yeah, let's let's let's. Uh, have you let's, done this before, uh, Matt? Yeah. Just curious how and how long you've been brewing too. Uh, I've been brewing um, the grain, all grains, for about a year. And prior to that, just doing some extract kits and then helping some buddies brew on a larger system. So, okay, that's a good that's way to learn. Yeah, yeah. 
That's cool. All right. And have you have you done anything like this before? A, a jalapeno smoked porter before? No, no, this is the first one for this one. <laughs> okay. What made you do the that two the two combinations of a, a jalapeno and a smoked porter? Um, I was actually just looking through um like Beersmith and some other recipe areas and I this one just kind of popped out and I like porters, the wife likes porters, and it's like, well, let's let's try something a little different. I've already done a couple of porters, so I'll just you know spiced up a little bit, I guess. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Right um, all right, Char, let's go. Or Cooper, sorry, excuse me. I Did didn't, you just you, call me Char? <laughs> I didn't mean to compliment you. I apologize. Um, yeah, go yeah. ahead and start us off. I'll pour some and uh listen to you. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, you know. Yeah, I appreciate you sending this beer and uh, uh, sending us something interesting to work with here. So uh, the beer had a good fill, fill level and everything, uh, proper capping, moderately low hiss upon opening. Uh, aroma wise, it's, um, it's got a pretty firm chocolate and coffee thing right up front. Uh, a lot of coffee actually, it seems like. Uh, and the... Um, there's a green pepper element that comes right through like you get, like you get from uh, some beers with uh, kind of a over extracted use of coffee in a way like sometimes you get those weird uh, uh, coffee porters or stouts that have have that green pepper flavor to them. I understand this is not a coffee beer so I'm just the, the green pepper is I'm sure just coming from the, the pepper that's in the beer instead so that's interesting to like to taste a beer like this and taste oh there's that green pepper thing but it's coming from a pepper not coffee uh i think unless you snuck something in here that we don't know about that wasn't declared but we'll ask you about your recipe later <laughs> um yeah so uh you know the uh esters are pretty low there, there's no obvious hop it shouldn't well, it shouldn't be a, well depending on what kind of porter you know and you can just declare these as just porter or you can say robust porter or you know you know whatever kind of porter you want uh but it's um yeah it's not too hoppy uh no dms or diastole it smells a little sp spicy in general i guess you could say um that peppery quality the phenolic is coming through lightly fruity esters uh, it has kind of a I was, I was hunting for the smoke it has kind of a vaguely faint ashiness to it but there's nothing that screams wow this is a smoked beer to me it's more like huh the uh there's a roasty element to this beer could it could it be malt or is it the smoke that was you know the smoked malt that was added so i was i'm, I'm working at getting towards where that level uh is and what it what it should be uh appearance wise it looks really nice uh pours a Good sized head of uh, dark tan bubbles at first. Um, had kind of a speckled looking appearance at first with some finer foam encapsulating some larger bubbles. Um, the head retention is actually fairly good. Um, it's, a, it's a really dark brown, very rich color. Um, and it seems to be, uh, it seems to have a good clarity. If you look at it at the corners, you can see through it a little bit at the edges there. So uh, I'm going to give it full points for appearance. Getting into the flavor, uh, very rich, dark malt character, perhaps a little, a little rich for a, for a porter and almost bordering, you know, getting towards more of a, a stout like uh, territory almost. Uh, it really, uh, that dark roasty malt character kind of dominates the, the beer throughout um it's quite dry in the finish so that might be another reason that it's kind of standing out there's not a lot of sweetness here to uh, to play off and kind of meld with those dark malt uh, flavors um it has a fairly firm bitterness as well and i think some of that is coming from the highly kilned highly roasted malts not necessarily uh from any hops uh, it does have a very low earthy hop flavor it's kind of buried in there uh, I would say the pepperiness comes through only very faintly and pretty mild. It's not biting, uh, just a hint of some pepper, uh, mainly in the back of the throat. As you drink more of it, it comes through. But it's pretty mellow on that aspect. Um, it's a clean ale. I mean, it's balanced to the malt. Um, there's no, definitely not, not a lot of hop going on here. 
Um, and it's not really balanced even to the specialty ingredients that you have uh, declared. Um, the aftertaste is kind of, it has a little kind of burnt roasty note in the background, kind of an ashy malt character in the aftertaste. Um, and the dryness again, kind of lets that, that rougher kind of, uh, won't necessarily say harshness, but the, that biting kind of roastiness come through a little bit more. The, the fermentation on the beer seems like it's clean though. It's, it, it, it fermented out. It's, it's very nicely attenuated. So it's, it's, it's finished out well. And it, 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 the fermentation did what it was supposed to, um, you know, I'm not getting, I'm getting phenolics in the beer, but it seems like they're from the peppers and not from, uh, any wild fermentation that got loose in there or anything like that. It doesn't have that kind of an impression to it at all. So, um, clean and, um, just an interesting twist on the, on a, a Porter style and with the specialty ingredients and, uh, you know, being kind of low, uh, mouthfeel wise, I guess you could say it's a bit biting overall with some astringent graininess, a little bit of harshness from the roasted grains, probably. There's no real warmth of alcohol, uh, but you do get a touch of warmth from the, the chilies. Uh, it's not a creamy beer. Um, carbonation is medium. Uh, the body is kind of medium there as well, although it seems lighter because it's so dry to me. I think it just has the impression of like, it, it has a little body to it and then it dries away and it's, you're left with that. Like, okay, it, it's gone and then take another sip. And it's, um, you know, it, it sounds like I'm kind of picking on a lot of different aspects of the beer in a way, but overall impression, I guess, it's really not a, it's not a, it's a, it's a decent sipper. It's not a hard beer to, to drink at all. It's just really all the, the flavors that are going on, especially the, um, the, the, the kind of bigger roastiness in it is uh, dominating but it, it doesn't make it like oh man i can't drink this it's awful it just makes it a little out of balance for the um uh for a porter style just at, on its own and then the pepper is low you can definitely uh you definitely should would want to bring that up a, a fair amount to blend better with the style if you want to declare i mean like i almost i noticed the jalapeno but it's not like I'd have to drink it for a while and let the afterburn kind of settle in and, and notice. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's what it is. Cause I get the green pepper and I would think, Oh, maybe is, did they put coffee in here and do it weird? But it's like, no, it's actually, it's green jalapeno peppers in there. It's just low and it's really subtle. And like a lot of times I will be a proponent for balance and like, okay, like really use your green pepper subtly and don't go crazy with it or it's going to take over. And in, you know, in a beer like this, where there's already a lot of flavors, it's going to get harsh and gnarly. But, you know, um, I think that some of the other flavors are what's making it a little more biting. And, and I'll, I would definitely back off um, some of the highest Lava Bond malts, um, whatever that the darkest malt are in here that, uh, that are giving it that, that, that rich um, roastiness it's having difficulty letting those other things shine through and being able to discern any actual smoked malt, like the, you know, the character uh, that you, you want in there that you declared it's, as a smoked beer. You know, I think of a, a nice smoked porter, the, you know, the Alaskan smoked porter, you know, is what the, has that balance where it has a, it's not a harsh biting uh, um, uh, porter, but it's, it's rich and it's rich enough, but the, the smoke stands up to it in a way that it's like, okay, that comes out fairly evenly. And it is hard to get that balance, but you definitely want to uh, push the, the smoked up, smoked malt up and pull back some of the darkest malts. If you want to get that balance just a little bit better in the spear. Um, it does seem again, again, like a very cleanly fermented beer with good ingredients that were used and, and really no obvious flaws or anything like that. It's, it's, it's drinkable and it's, it's fun. It's just, to a beer judge like this is just coming across less than you know I, to say it, on the specialty ingredients and more than on the the, the richy roast roastiness there so you just have to tread that line and find the right balance uh some of the intense flavors in a an already strongly flavored beer like this uh to get them to stand out and play right so you know i i enjoyed the beer i guess i landed at a at a 30 which is a 
the very low end of very good. It's it's good. It's drinkable. It's it's not bad. It's just if you want to impress a judge and get the a balance on a beer, we're going to enter in a competition and and win a medal with it. You're halfway there. You just it needs some twisting and 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 balancing and and and, and a little bit of work to get there. But you obviously know how to brew a clean beer, and that's a that's half the battle right there. So, you know, um, thank you for sharing. I enjoyed it, and and it's a. Uh, it's definitely an interesting drinker. I just, it's like, where's the, where's the beef? You know, where's the, where's the, where's the jalapeno? Where's the, where's the smoke? It's not quite there, but um, you know, thank you for sharing it. And I'll, I'll see what Brian has to say about this one too. There you go. All right, Char, let's do it. I haven't heard about where's the, haven't heard where's the beef uttered by someone in like a, a way <laughs> long time. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, so Matt, uh, are you in a, are you in a homebrew club? I am. Yep. Which, uh, which one? It's the Muddy River Mashers. Excellent. You don't have a, uh, a funky acronym, but I kind of appreciate that. Uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, we've had a lot of uh, rugged individualists the last few shows, so it's nice to hear someone that's in a, uh, in a club. I also like your, your Christmas decorations. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I largely echo what, what Brian uh, had to say. Uh, I like this beer, uh, but I think my issues with it come from the declared ingredients, not from the uh, uh, this the the beverage. If, if if it were unlabeled and I were drinking it, I would have a different. Uh, I would probably score. I would score it differently than because of what it was was declared. Uh, the aroma, uh, it's it uh, overall is kind of low. Uh, I get low dark malt, uh, very low smoke, uh, no uh, no hop aroma, and no jalapeno aroma. In fairness. A jalapeno as an ingredient isn't really going to give you much aroma other than maybe a, a green pepper. And I, I do get like maybe a hint of a, of a green pepper, but to me, that's more in the, the flavor than the aroma. No off aromas. Uh, I gave it six out of 12, primarily due to the fact that the smoked, smoked malt character was really not, I, I would have to talk myself into it almost to, to get that in the, the aroma. Uh, appearance, three out of three. Uh, color is uh, extremely dark brown. Uh, it's very clear as far as I can determine. Uh, head is really large and persistent. I mean, I poured this like an hour ago, and here you can still see there's some some head on this. So that's uh, that's really fantastic. Uh, the flavor um, begins with dark malt. Uh, I get a low smoke character, but it's it's a very low smoke character. Uh, but then also get the the green pepper character that Brian was talking about, uh, and I I totally I'm totally with Brian that balance is key. I mean you don't want a, a jalapeno smoked po uh, porter or any or any jalapeno beer that just is ripping your face off with heat. I mean that that's not good. There was a beer that was in clear bottles in like 1998 called like. Was it like Jimmy's Cave Creek uh, yes. chili beer? Yeah, or yeah, 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 Do you yeah. remember that shit? And you get it yeah. at Safeway or whatever, and it literally had like a chili pepper in each bottle. And the bottles were clear, so you could see the chili pepper. And I remember my neighbor had some of these, and he didn't want them. Like, he had one and didn't like it. He knew I liked beer, so he gave me like the rest of his six-pack. And I had one one night and it was just undrinkable because, I mean, they <laughs> shoved the chili pepper into like a, bo a clear bottle of bad lager. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that's, that's, you know, no one needs to go to that end. I mean, I guess if you're a super chili head and that's what you're into, fine, knock yourself out. But if you're trying to make a drinkable beer and you're trying to make a drinkable beer for competition, uh, balance, balance is important. But Having said that, I mean, the only character that I really got of jalapeno, uh, and I, I opened both bottles just to be sure there wasn't like a bottle variation. The only jalapeno character I really got was that green pepper flavor at kind of a low level uh, in, in the flavor. And similarly, you know, smoked malt is really tricky and you don't want to overdo it because you can very easily uh, uh, over smoke a beer. Uh, and that gets to be unpleasant and meaty, and you get like this you get weird summer sausage type of flavors that nobody, no, ma no matter how much you like summer sausage, nobody wants to drink a summer sausage. Uh, so uh, the, 
you, you kind of pick two tricky ingredients uh, uh, to work with here, and, and they both, I think, require some trial and error uh, as much as anything else to get to the levels that you want. Uh, so uh, malt remains prominent in mid-palate. Bitterness is low. Uh, didn't really get any heat. Uh, I did get a slight uh, cardboard oxidation, uh, but I, I got that earlier, and then I don't get it now. So it might just be, uh, I, I might just chalk that up to uh, uh, drinker variation. <laughs> it's sort of sip to sip, and that might not really be there. Uh, it's well attenuated. The finish is medium length and malt oriented. Uh, gave it nine out of 10 for flavor. Uh, Mouthfeel five out of five. Uh, low carbonation, medium body, creamy, no warming. Uh, and that's pun not intended. That's the warming from alcohol, not the warming from, from jalapeno. Uh, overall impression, I gave it a five for a total of, of 28. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the base, the base beer. I thought the base beer was, was well made. Uh, there were no uh, off, off aromas, maybe a hint of oxidation, I, although that might just be, like I said, I, I got a hint of that maybe half an hour ago, and I, I'm not now. So I'm willing to just assume that I was wrong for, for that. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it's when you declare ingredients for uh, a specialty beer like this, you know, both smoked malt and jalapeno, uh, smoked malt can be super tricky. You want to be able to, to taste the smoked malt and smell the smoked malt, but you don't want it to overwhelm everything else in the beer because that gets to be really unpleasant also. Uh, unless you're drinking like that Schlenker law and you have like three of them <laughs> because yeah. it takes like that first one to get through to kind of get used to the, the fact that you're drinking that. And then you can kind of appreciate the next two. But I mean, that's those Bam, they've been doing that in Bamberg for a thousand years and nobody, you know, I, I, I think that trying to duplicate something like that is a, a just kind of a fool's errand. Uh, I think something like Brian was saying earlier, balance is really important. So having, the smoked character is good, uh, but kind of just like you don't want it to be all the way turn up to 11. You don't want to turn it down to, you know, less than one either. So I think a little next time I would add, you know, maybe up your smoked malt 50%, see what happens. Uh, I don't know that I double it because I, I do get some smoked character, but I'd maybe 50% it up. Uh, and then also with the jalapenos, uh, I'll be curious to hear how you added those, but you might consider like a, like a tincture where you chop one up and put it in a little bit of vodka and then just, you know, pour yourself 12 ounces of that beer and then uh, put in uh, one drop and see what you think. Uh, the two drops, uh, three drops. Uh, and then when you're, you go to bottle, you just know, okay, well, I know that six drops gives me the exact character that I want. Uh, and you can maybe go with with that approach to maybe more precisely control the jalapeno. Because I would have liked to have. Uh, I was kind of excited when I got this beer. I'm like, Ooh, this sounds really good, and it, it it is good. I mean, I'm I'm enjoying this, and it's it's a tasty beer. Uh, I was kind of hoping for a little bit uh, of that heat complexity and a little more of the the smoked complexity. Uh, but thank you for sharing, and I definitely appreciate that. I'm looking forward to hearing how you uh, how you did this. All right. I would also too agree with the, like the 50% recommendation. You don't like, I was like, oh, well, it's so low. You want to double it. No, you don't want to double it. Like one and a half <laughs> is probably a good place to start as just a baseline and say, okay, this is really good. Or this is not quite there. And then yeah. as you bring up the smoke and the jalapeno, they're going to play off each other differently. So you might want to adjust them differently from there. So yeah. Yeah. I, and I'll, I'm just going to jump in real fast and echo what everybody else has said. Um, I, I, I think you, you need to dial in the porter recipe first, then you can smoke it and then do the jalapenos. If you're really trying to get competition, if you're just having fun, then, you know, you can keep tweaking it and do whatever. But I think the porter definitely needs to have a little more roundness to it, a little more sweetness to it, a little more fullness. And I, I'm, I'm interested to hear the recipe because I think it's going to be um, my take is, is like, it might be a little over roasty and I think that's giving the coffee quality. And then you have the jalapeno, which is giving that green pepper. And then it makes it, it's very, rem very reminiscent of coffee grounds in a beer kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, overall it's great. And I do get a little bit of the heat 
little bit like prickly on the palate a little bit. I think I get more heat than Brian too. I get a little yeah. bit of heat in the mouthfeel and then just a little bit. Well, we after. have younger we have younger palates than he does, Cooper. And so. you know, my and my wife is Mexican, so we uh, uh, eat a lot. We, we <laughs> eat a little more spicy. So there we go. That's right. Uh, all right, Matt, go ahead, please. Give us uh, give us the rundown, man. All righty. Well, thank you guys for the feedback. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm gonna try to brew it again, most definitely. Um, the recipe, like I said, I got off of uh, Rick Beersmith, so I'll just kind of jump into that right away. Um, about 40, uh, about 50% of two row, uh, 21% of Munich, uh, 12% of a black barley, uh, 5% of crystal 60, uh, three and a half percent of smoked malt, uh, 3% of chocolate malt, and then 2% of crystal 40, 2% of crystal 80, 2% of acid malt, and then 0.4% of carapils. So quite a, quite a bucket list there. And then... Yeah, I, I think, Matt, we're going to... I'm going to stop you real quick. Sure. I think that probably all three of us had the exact same reaction hearing that malt bill. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, lot of there's, there's a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, That you're not getting much out of. And then there's the 12%, the black malt, that you're getting a mm. lot out of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's you know yeah you gotta you gotta start somewhere and you're getting it uh and like it. and like that smoked malt at like three percent that's mm -hmm. good and I, I don't know cooper do you think maybe trying five percent next time yeah possibly the the smoke malt at three percent was pretty low so and depending on what kind of smoke malt it is too um you're gonna get varying amounts from it and tasting the malts is gonna help tell you what what's in there but anyway could yeah. continue please <laughs> <laughs> no problem um it was 0.75 ounces of Cascade at 60 minutes. Um, 0.42 ounces, because I was doing just a two and a half gallon batch. That's why ah. the smaller amounts. Uh, so 0.42 ounces of um, William, William Met at 10 minutes. And then three quarters of an ounce of um, Tetanin at five minutes. And then the jalapenos were 3.3 ounces added in at the five minute mark. And then the yeast was the London Ale yeast from Y Yeast Labs at 1028. So you did a two and a half gallon batch, but 12 ounces of black malt? It's 12%. 12%. 12 percent. Okay. All right. <laughs> if it was 12 ounces of black malt, we would not be able, we'd probably still be scraping our tongues right now. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, how did, you, the, how did you do the jalapenos? Did you, yeah. How did you prep those? Those were um, just pretty much cutting off the stems, um, cutting down the center. Mm. And that's kind of all they, um, kind of one of the recipes I found was how it hell at them. So okay. was it all the seeds went in everything. All the seeds went yeah. in everything into the. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, later. yeah. I wonder if, you know, if you, you prepare a bunch of jalapenos, but use all the seeds but half of the flesh i wonder if that would give you more more spice because that's really what we're after we're after some heat but we're after less vegetal and i think more more spice i i've never done this i don't know anybody who's done this, so so don't go out and just do it in like a 20 gallon batch but i wonder if you know if you, if you cut back on the flesh but still added the seeds from that jalapeno that you didn't put in does that make sense i wonder if that would give you a little bit more balance would you yeah. maybe suggest switching over to a different pepper, like a cayenne pepper. It doesn't have no, no. taste. I like jalapeno. I mean, I, yeah, I think the jalapenos, I think what, what makes the jalapeno beers desirable is that interplay with the flesh and the spiciness because the, the flesh does have, or like a darker green pepper thing. I mean, you know, people eat jalapenos. They don't eat cayenne peppers, you know, pickled sure. cayenne pepper. So I think those flavors are, are, are fine. I mean, if you wanted to, to to really get weird, you can go like ancho chilies or whatever, or um, you know, or Anaheim chilies, the the, the big green ones. Right. Like, but I think that might take it a little down a more right. bell pepper flavor. Um, but anyway, that's that's a side. I think I think that's like four steps down the road. I think <laughs> I think we, we let's work on yeah. your your porter recipe here for a second. And I've had some other. Um... Uh, chili beers where the part of the way that uh, somebody has mellowed out the chilies when they use a lot of chili in a beer 
is to blanch them and that, you know, to treat the, the plant matter that way might do something nice to it. Uh, but yeah, I kind of like JP's suggestion of maybe using a little less because what we're getting is more of the green pepper, like the okay. skin and the, the meat of the, uh, the, the fruit or the pepper, whatever you call it. And, uh, and less of that nice oily, like rich uh, spiciness that comes from the seeds. So maybe using a little more of the seeds, at least some, some amount more is the key here uh, to getting that element right and not going crazy with it, but just boosting it up a little bit. So I'm getting it in the back of the throat. It's just, and then again, pulling back that darkest roast malt is going to help that come out better too. So if you do both things at once, it might just swing too much the opposite way. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Uh, what did the, the beer um, start and finish at? It seems like a very dry, dry porter. Yeah. Um, our original was a 1045 and then finished around like a 1021. So, okay. That's not too dry. 1021. No, I, no, I, and I did have it in the I mean, fermenter for uh, 12 days. So <laughs> I'm just not getting the sweetness that, yeah. Brian, are you? I'm surprised about it. Are you too, Brian? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I can't. We can't hear you, Brian. Sorry, that's kind of surprising to me, also, and maybe that has to do with uh, maybe all that black malt is I think so. uh, kind of counter. You know, maybe that that bitterness and that kind of what other maybe that keeps that all that black malt from being uh, uh, too harsh, right? Because I was surprised how much black malt that is, and maybe that black malt is kind of counterbalancing the uh, the relatively uh low attenuation the ashy aspect of that it gives you the the impression of some dryness and maybe yeah yeah kind of stand, stands in the place of bitterness uh to to balance the the sweetness yeah. uh matt where did you get that porter recipe from it's from the beer smith oh from beer smith okay i would um get into uh brewing classic styles by jamil okay. zanishev and grab I'm, I'm sure he has a porter recipe in there um, and just use a tried and true recipe that people have used. I mean, not that no one's used the beer Smith before, but, um, Jamil is really good at sort of stripping a lot of stuff down and okay. focusing flavors. I would, I would do that first. I would I'll find a good, uh, a clone recipes book with like a Deschutes Black Butte recipe in it or something like that, that, that somebody's paid attention to and really gotten kind of close to that you know, that nice robust porter kind of thing. Cause it seems like you, you must like a fairly robust porter with all that dark malt in there. Yeah. And that's a good point, Brian. I, th I think, I think making, turning this into a robust porter recipe would, would, would then support the smoke, which can then support the jalapeno. Uh, I mean, a 1041 beer, a beer is not, I mean, you know, you, you got a light handed smoke in that. That's not really, I don't yeah, know. A ro robust porter is going to probably start a little higher than that. It's so, going to start yeah. higher than that. And it's going to give you the sweetness that we're missing. And I think the sweetness can help ride the smoke a little bit. And then all that's going to play with the heat from the jalapenos eventually. Yeah. This, this is almost like a, a, you know, mild territory with just a lot of roast. It's like, okay, it's got all the roast of a porter, but it's mild strength. So it's a, uh, you know, yeah. it's not, not playing right there somehow. <laughs> Interesting. But, um, you know, you know, the fermentation was clean and, and you did some, some really nice things with it. And it's not, it's definitely not undrinkable. It's, it's, it's a, a drinkable beer. It just doesn't I think have, I think it's a really cool first effort. I mean, because, yeah. because if you think oh, yeah. about it, all of the three things that he tried to do, he did. There's some spice in there. There's some heat in there from all happening. I wouldn't, maybe you can call it heat. It's more like a spice, you know, feeling, but that's in there. The smoke is in there and it's a porter. So for all three of those things to kind of hit at the same time, I think is really hard with a beer with two, with two distinct layers of, of, you know, of uh, adjuncts, I guess, smoke and jalapeno. So Matt, I think you're, you're on the ball. I think you know what you're doing. It's just minor. Well, I mean, I think in the porter, I, I would, I would either, I would just switch styles and go robust or something like that. If you like that uh -huh. style again. Um, oh, boy, you answered all the questions. I have a question yeah. for you though, too. I, I I'm interested about the 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 two and a half gallon batch size. Is that something that you've always done as a home brewer? Is just like you'd like to make smaller batches to be able to experiment more, or you just don't 
want to, you know, you don't, you don't want to have so much that you have to share it all to get rid of it. And you want to drink it fresh or what's the impetus there? I wonder. Um, when I was doing the extract brewing, I was doing the, the five gallon batches and I was bottling everything. And then, you know, I just wasn't getting rid of the bottles. I had leftovers and yeah. it's, it's a while. And so then it's like, okay. Then I kind of got out of brewing for, you know, six months or so. And then kind of got back into it and I jumped back in doing some one gallon batches just for my own personal I mean, and then it kind of, okay, I liked them and just kind of moved into the, the two and a half gallons. Just it's enough that I can just still share, but I'm not stuck with it for six months. And I can keep going. I think I would find it hard to control a recipe with a one gallon batch. It's like a few more grains of some, some, those, uh, those are um, some kits that I bought <laughs> out of a um, uh, place out of New York. So those are yeah. mainly the kits on the one gallon batches. And once I kind of, decided all the work to end up with six to eight beers. I was like, okay, let's just go to the two and a half gallons and go from there. Yeah. And I've got some of those two and a half gallon, the three gallon kegs, and it's a nice amount because you can pour it and drink it relatively quickly and have it fresh. And you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a beer that you bring to a festival to share with your friends. You can just, you know, go through it and, and sip it while it's fresh and be done with it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, anything else, Matt? Anything else you want to ask the boys? Um, yeah, let me see. I did have a couple of notes, but I think pretty much um, one thing I, when I cold crash it, this is the first time I bought a used fridge and I um, had it set at like 60, 66 degrees. So it kind of stayed right around that 63 degrees. Yeah. And then I cold crashed it down to 35 and I had some off the blow off tube, um, some stuff come back into the beer. The hose is filling back up because of the cold condensing. And then some guys from the brew club said, just pull the hose out and let it sit. And instead of getting, chancing it, I guess. So I guess what's your guys' recommendations on that? Uh, cold crashing at the suction of the... Exactly. Yep. How do you guys battle that? I, I, I don't know that that would be the most... The thing I would worry most about, okay. uh, but having said that, when uh, like Jamil talks about this a lot, and I, I think he's right that you don't want to crash anything uh, because when you go to when you cold crash, like you turn your dial down from say sixty five to thirty five or whatever, that rapid temperature decrease will cause the yeast a lot of stress and distress and when that happens to them they tend to like explode and then they just all the the yeast innards get out and it's you know it's I'm oversimplifying because i'm not a, a biochemist but i mean there's because they're suddenly panicky that they're going to be freezing and dying like they start to emit you know, flavors and things that are not they're, they're considered off flavors and off aromas. You want to try to decrease gradually. Okay. I don't think you have to have a controller where you program it to go a degree an hour or whatever, but just like over the space of a few days, uh, you know, just, or this, whatever, just crank, you know, you're walking by your fermenter, uh, turn it down two degrees, you know, turn your, uh, turn it down three degrees, whatever. Uh, I wouldn't turn it down a lot, but that's kind of the kind of always been my like janky homemade way of not crashing yeast is just if you just go out to look at your fermenter, you know, three, four times a day and you turn it down, you know, a degree or two each time, you'll be down 20 degrees in you know three days. But it's not going to be this precipitous. Oh, God, we're going down 30 degrees and you know, <laughs> three hours thing. It's going to cause the yeast uh, uh, stress and have them emit things you don't want. Well, so you, yeah, you want to like think about like bringing in oxygen too in the in the cold crash because yeah. you're you're bringing in air. I've actually filled up um, balloons with CO two and just put like attached them to the top of the airlock and it sucks in the CO two. I mean, there's probably a way better way to do that. This is just a stupid. Uh, like oh well, let's try this and it kind of the balloon sucked down to nothing and it like it probably didn't do anything <laughs> for my beer and it probably put balloon powder in the beer and made it worse uh, I, like i had had i had had bad luck with cold crushing before where i did a beer uh or a mead actually and i had the um the other end of the hose and a, a, a fairly full thing of 
of star sen and the star sen like <laughs> pulled itself into the beer into the the mead mm-hmm. and it was just like oh man I just in it like three quarters of a gallon like went into the meat. It was like, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I've had but, that hundred percent. Yeah. But I, I kind of feel like that's, you know, it's still going to happen when you cool off your beer, no matter what, because of the temperature yeah. differential. But I feel like if you only turn it down a little bit at a time, that Delta of temperature, which is what causes the Delta pressure that causes the gas to go into your fermenter, it's not going to be as strong uh, and I don't know, I, I don't have any experimental data to back this up. It's my belief that keeping that delta smaller uh, is what's going to keep you from sucking in a lot of air. I, mm-hmm. I could be wrong. But I, again, I feel like getting back to what we talked about earlier, I, I think that right now, the more productive thing for you to do is to uh, fine tune that porter recipe uh, and get that the way you want it. You know, simplify that recipe. I think your hops sound fine. All that. Simplify your malt bill. Uh, pick a yeast that maybe attenuates a little bit more. Uh, and at that point, uh, then it's worth, okay, you can fine tune the jalapenos. You can fine tune your cold crashing or, or what have you. Uh, but that, I mean, what do you guys think? Does that sound like the right uh, path right. for him to go? Might not be also yeast drainage. It could, could just be yeast uh, treatment and making sure that you have a uh, a proper amount of uh, you know pretty vigorous yeast going into that that brew ready to go. Um, you know, I like um, you know if you're if you're doing it sounds like you're you're brewing fairly simply. I like the the simple home brewing. You know, uh, the Denny and Drew book. Uh, they have a lot of good tips and just the shake starter with a you know you can use a can of proper and um, you know, just put your yeast in it and shake it 18 hours before you're going to brew in a growler and get that yeast nice and vigorous and go, uh, you know, you don't have to have the scientific lab with the stir plate and all the fancy stuff and do, you know, three liter starters. You can just, you know, get, get your yeast nice and happy and vigorous and ready to go and put it in there. And especially with a two and a half gallon batch, if you, you know, uh, there's good yeast calculators out there that you can use, um, that will also take into account the the freshness of your yeast that you're putting in and, and everything else. And just, you know, try to try to be careful about making sure you're putting it the right way. It's you're going to have more problems um, under pitching than you are slightly over pitching, I think. So and you can also get yeast from, a you know, there's plenty of good craft breweries around us. A lot of them are, you know, if you buy beer from them and you talk to the brewer about their stuff, you know, they, they're probably happy to share some yeast, too and um yeah. you know getting that's getting all, yeast. that's all little little tiny details here happy man. amounts of yeast to yeah. to make your beer take off right and ferment down you know to the right territory even though i i thought it was too dry <laughs> but uh anyway sometimes all i'm right, off my rocker Perfect. I think, thank you guys so much yeah thank you i appreciate it keep trying man and send us a rebrew if you do it I most definitely will thanks guys all right. thanks brother sure, thanks, man. Fun beer. All right, yep, we're gonna take a you. quick break and we'll be right back here on dr homebrew all right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We're here to wrap up the show. What are we doing? You're gonna wrap. I'm gonna wrap up the show. Um, okay. Yeah, that was man. You know what? I I kind of like that beer. You know, the more I drink it uh, during the break there, while uh, when Matt leaves, it's not bad. It, it's not a bad beer. It's just it's, it just needs it needs some guidance. It needs it's got a lot of good flavors in it. It's not yeah. It's a little out of balance, but that's a fine point, I think, and. You could definitely improve this and make it an award-winning beer with the right hand. I agree. I agree. All right. We're going to split, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Thank you for supporting the Brewing Network. Uh, Thank you for listening to all the shows. We have a bunch of sessions that just came out. So, uh, you know, check out that. Of course, Brew Strong is still live and kicking. We're still doing a good job over here, too. So uh, thank you very much. We try. We do try. Until you want to send us us a beer, Brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. There you go. That's all I will say. There you go. Any fermented thing, you know, traditional African, uh, you know, ale or whatever, do that. Why don't you show Mark up, dude? Hmm. Fuzzy peach beer. This peach O's. I don't know. I thought that was really funny. 
Yeah. Oh, peach O's. What the fuck is wrong? Oh, peaches. <laughs> oh, got it. Okay, I got it. You're still talking about the peach O's. Yeah. yeah let's let's send good. us a somebody send us a peach O beer. Why not? I think someone has. That's why that's what that's why it stuck out. I think we've oh. had a, a a beer with like those peach O's hmm. years ago. Anyway. I don't, yeah. All right, everybody. Take care. And uh until next time, we'll see you later.